Hi, today we have uh, Dr. McMackey. She is an uh, Associate Professor of Clinical Science and Cognitive Neuroscience mm -hmm. in the Department of Psychology at Florida International University. Um, and we have Dr. Eng. Um, she conducts research with the goal of advancing the science and practice of psychotherapy for youth, especially adolescents with depression. And uh, well, we, they both are working on a study right now. Um, and we want to kind of talk about it and uh, provide some useful information for our youth and our kids and their families. So yeah, I don't know if you want to add something to it. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to this interview. Thank you both for being here. I know it's uh, really hard to get some time <laughs> for anything um, nowadays, but um, yeah, I'm really get, glad you're here today. So I want this uh, interview to be kind of um, divided into two, two parts. So one uh, could be more simple and more, um, yeah, more, more simple information that we can show to the kids maybe, to the youth and their families for them to understand. And um, the other part will be more in depth about the the studies you're working on and some, I don't know if you have some tips, advices or anything, that would be great. So yeah, I wanted to start maybe with a question I have and maybe how to differentiate um, being sad and maybe being um, depressed. Like what could this mean or um, how this expression of this emotion, this sad, being sad, which is just normal, um, how this could uh, become a little bit more problematic. You want me to take that one, Maya? Because I think you'll do a lot of the talking about the study. So maybe I'll take this easy one. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's an excellent question. You know, what differentiates feeling sad or down or having emotions from actually being depressed? Um, and it's something that you, it really requires a professional to uh, make that determination. But let me share with you a couple aspects of that that a clinician or a professional is really listening for. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna focus on teenagers because we know that depression is, it can be present throughout the lifespan, but we see a tremendous rise in adolescence. So right after puberty, we see almost a threefold increase in depression rates. Um, and we also see a shift in gender representation. So it seems to affect girls more than boys at a rate of about two to one. And we don't know all the reasons for that. And it's, it's kind of a, an area of investigation. But I just say that to say that the prevalence of depression is increasing so rapidly during this time that it's actually affecting about one in five youth at any given time. So it's quite common um, in teenagers to begin with. And then often, as, as you sort of know, we hear from parents or from kids like, oh, well, they're just a teenager and that's why they're emotional, right? So how do you make the, the determination of whether it's depression or not? So what we listen for for depression is when you're, first of all, you, you have one of the two following symptoms. You're either feeling sad or down or irritable most of the day, nearly every day for a period of at least two weeks for what we call major depression. For other types of depression, it might not be every day, but but frequently enough that it's getting in the way of things, or you feel a lack of sort of pleasure and an enthusiasm and motivation for things that you used to enjoy. We call that anhedonia. So the first question is, are one of those two things happening? Um, and for a period of at least two weeks. And if the answer to that is yes, then there are a number of, of other things we look for, like has your sleep been disrupted? Is your appetite disrupted? Um, are you, socially isolating yourself. You don't want to be around other people um, in a way that's, that's different from before um, you felt this, this mood shift. Um, are you wanting to hurt yourself or harm yourself or having thoughts about suicide or just death and darkness in general? Um, are you feeling guilty about things that really aren't your fault? So these are all some of the symptoms that we listen to and for, and we're listening for about five or six of these or four or five of these actually to be, to be happening in addition to those mood changes that I mentioned. And then last, and this is maybe the most critical thing is, is it getting in the way of your life? Um, because if you're having just sort of transient up and down mood stuff um, that just goes along with your day and it's part of the ups and downs of life, and especially for teenagers who encounter a lot of stressors, 
that's not really depression. So is it getting in the way of how you're doing at school, how you're getting along with family, how you're getting along with friends, um, the degree to which you're even getting out of the house, for example, all of those kinds of areas of impairment or getting in the way of things are, are what make the difference between feeling in a bad mood versus having it affect your life in a, in a clinically diagnosable way. So long answer, but hopefully I got some content <laughs> for you. Yeah, it, it was a long answer, but I think it's really important to know kind, uh, kind of how to differentiate somehow um, besides um, maybe before get, going to a professional. Um, and yeah, well, since you are both professionals, um, I don't know if you have maybe some, uh, some tips that we can uh, share regarding how to be aware of those symptoms. Like maybe if uh, they're having like this lack of motivation, um, but not maybe the, the, the feeling sad part every time, or like, how could you uh, give some tips about it? I'll take that one, maybe, or do you want me to? Um, I mean, maybe I can start and you can jump in. Uh, I mean, most people have things that they like to do, you know, even if you're stressed, they do things to relax and have fun. So if things don't feel fun anymore, you know, you used to love to go out, you used to love to play video games or whatever it is, and you just don't want to do that anymore. Or if you're a parent or a friend noticing that a teen kind of doesn't like to do what they used to like to do anymore, uh, that is one of the, the core symptoms of depression. Okay. Um, do you have something to add, at Dana? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime your mood shifts in a way that um, is noticeable to you and it's, and it's going on for, you know, a couple weeks or longer, that's really a time to reach out to someone and, and talk about it with a professional and see if they can help identify whether there's something that can be, whether or not you have depression, but also maybe to even prevent depression, you know, getting some support and help before it even evolves to that state, to that point. Okay, and maybe uh, some people might feel that they have this lack of motivation, but um, what would you say would be some um, first steps to kind of work with the kids and provide them maybe uh, ways to motivate themselves? Is that possible that uh, maybe the parents can do that somehow first? at first or during the process of having uh, like these meetings with a professional or everything, like what could be the part of the parents in there? You know, I think a few things, I think one is listening, you know, communicating with your kiddo and asking how they're doing and being, being ready to listen and hear about that, giving them space to talk with friends, et cetera. And also keeping things moving, right? So if it's getting hard to get to school in the morning because you're not feeling well, parents can really assist with sort of giving you a nudge out the door. And we don't want that to be super coercive or create a lot of conflict. It really should be done in, in, a, in a form of support. Um, but sometimes it can be helpful to have someone help you along to keep moving because by changing your behavior, sometimes we change our mood. So by engaging with the person, having new experiences, sometimes that actually helps lift our mood. Okay. Yes, I think that's a really big part of uh, having like uh, this youth with uh, this lack of motivation, like how we can help them besides uh, the work of a professional. However, uh, you would say that it would be the best to kind of um, go to a professional right away when, when they find these symptoms we already talked about, right? Yeah, I mean, it never hurts to get checked out and talk with someone. And, and if for some reason it's difficult to get into the office of a mental health professional, and it can be, sometimes schools have counselors or even just your pediatrician, you know, the person that you go to your well check visits for can also sometimes assist with figuring out if this is something that should be followed up on. Okay. And um, I've read a few articles you've worked on uh, about um, mobile apps and uh, how they could help somehow. So I don't know if you want to talk about it. Well, before we go into apps, because I think maybe you may have more on that, but I just wanted to say, it didn't occur to me, but I should also say, I mean, you can always look up um, resources for depression online too, right? And, and it'll give you a list of symptoms. Um, and let me find a good website. Well, maybe while you, maybe answers your question about apps. 
Maybe before we go a lot into apps, I mean, I think your earlier question or, you know, Dana's earlier suggestion about just staying well without even getting to depression, there are a lot more things, you know, that can be, that a kid can do or that a parent can kind of support their, their teen to do, which includes keeping a routine. I mean, I know like most routines have been disrupted and, you know, with the pandemic and things change with the pandemic and routines get disrupted again, but keeping a routine is really important, right? The teen doesn't really want to do something, kind of encouraging them to keep doing that is important. Staying physically active can really help to boost mood. So that means, right, taking walks or playing sports and it can be with friends. So which, which, um, uh, leads to the other thing, maintaining connections with other people, right? Because early on, we we're seeing one of the symptoms of depression is somebody starts to withdraw and they lose that support and they're feeling bad, you know? So it's like, um, you know, that, that kind of leads to this downward spiral. So just keeping up the connections with family and with friends uh, that can help a lot. I'd love to jump uh, in on that point, Mayi, because I often meet with teens and families and when they come to me, they'll say, you know, we don't think of irritability necessarily as being part of depression, but in teenagers being irritable can be a sign of depression as opposed to feeling sad, which is more typical in adults. And so when teens get real irritable, what can happen is parents get frustrated and they start to punish the teen by saying, well, you're not allowed to go out until your grades get better or until you get a better attitude. And that's where that downward spiral can get really dangerous, right? Because when you start to isolate further from friends and the things that you enjoy and other activities, the depression can actually get quite a bit worse. And so it is a fine balance, right? We have to have rules. We have to have, you know, certain things in the household that, that are standards uh, of the way we behave. And yet we also don't want to get so extreme that we cut kids off from the rest of their social world. So that's a really important balance for parents and kids to be aware of. One yes, more thing, I actually, yeah, yeah, actually maybe Dana can say a lot more about this, but maintaining that sleep schedule. So we talked about sleep being disrupted. Yeah. You know, some teens with depression are going to, or headed towards depression, are going to sleep too much and some too little. And kind of, so Dana, why don't you <laughs> take it up from there? Oh, you got it. I mean, <laughs> what we know about sleep and depression is that when you're not getting enough sleep or when you're sleep is of a poor quality, it can actually lead to depression. So it's not just a symptom of depression, it actually can predict worsening depression. So we do want to protect that sleep schedule and try to keep its timing nocturnal, right? That you're sleeping at night. I, I meet a lot of teens who are sleeping all day long and then doing virtual school overnight or something like that. And that just doesn't get you good quality sleep. And it doesn't keep you in a routine that allows you to interact with the rest of society, right? There's certainly online groups and stuff that you can interact with, but in general, we find that's just not enough when you're feeling really depressed. Um, so there can be, again, the downward spiral is kids are really miserable at school. They're not enjoying their social world there or their academic world. Parents then say, okay, well, maybe you could do virtual school. They go into virtual school. Now they see even fewer kids, their sleep starts to shift. So now they're sleeping really late into the day and having even less interaction. And so that's another typical thing that we, tend to observe and we want, we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Now, I will also say that sleep is challenging for teenagers and it's, it's potentially one of the reasons we see a rise in depression um, because the biological clock of teenagers shifts so they want to stay up a little bit later uh, and wake a little bit later and that's normal biology. And yet in many of our school systems, school is starting really, really early. So you're, you're having a squeeze in terms of the amount of time you have available for sleep. Um, and, and that's, you know, if that's a real challenge for any, any child or family, there are also resources for that, you know, to try to work with a professional and work on sleep, sleep health. Okay. I know you said two things that might be difficult for parents and for the youth. Uh, so I, I would like to start with the parents. So maybe it's not, not a big focus of your, your work, but how if, I don't know if you have any tips to deal with uh, these teenagers that are irritable. Um, so I don't know, like what they could do or if you have any tips or um, and how not to punish them right away, like how to start controlling themselves as parents and trying to, to provide them like, I don't know, like some car regulation somehow. I don't know if you have any tips on that. <laughs> Meaning. <laughs> 
so I want well, one of the hardest problems to solve in life. But yeah, go ahead, May. You got this. <laughs> so, so one of the formal tasks of development as a teen is to like start becoming their own individuals, separate from their parents, figuring out their identity, and I, I think it becomes more and more important that they want to make their own choices. So I think, you know, I know there are rules that need to be set in the house, but I think if the parent can allow some choices, you can do this and the consequence is this and you can do this and the consequence is that. So teen feels like there is a choice. Um, and, you know, um, so I, I, I think it will, will you know, be, be a little easier. Uh, so it's not kind of arguing only one, you know, over one option where the parent says it's this and nothing else. And the team says, no, I won't do it. Yeah. Trying to collaborate, find opportunities to see a win-win situation or, or, you know, be a little bit flexible and also trying to engage reward systems a little bit more in kids. We do little star charts and stuff like that. That doesn't really work for teenagers, but teenagers, you know, there's a lot of things teenagers want, whether they want time with their video games or time with their friends or um, a little bit of money to spend if that's available. And, and so there can be ways to sort of build in, sure, you can do that. And this, these are the steps to earn that and keeping it reasonable. You want a system where the earning it is, is pretty easy um, because that way you can encourage more and more earning of those opportunities and also that it happens frequently. So it's not like you have to behave this way for the next month to earn this thing three months from now. It's more on a day-to-day -day basis. What are the expectations in the home and what do you get for it as a motivating reward? Yes, I think this day-to-day -day basis is kind of the, the first step for everything. That, yeah. And um, oh, Can I have one more thing? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> not, 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 but I have one more thing, which is that um, I think that parents can often assume when kids are irritable that they don't want to be around their parents. And I just want to say that even though adolescents, as Mayi said accurately, are individuating, figuring out who they are, identifying their own identity, maybe wanting to be more independent, they also really still rely on family and still rely on their parents. And sometimes there can be miscommunication where kids are like feel a little vulnerable or uncomfortable saying that to their parents, but what they really want is more time with their parents, quality time um, where they have attention and they have uh, you know, a family member listening to what's going on in their life. And that listening may look different as a teenager than as a young child. It may be that you get very little tidbits of information from spending time with teens, um, but those little tidbits are important and it's important to spend the time if possible. Yes, and maybe not get this information uh, reactively, but more uh, trying to listen and, and, I don't know, kind of understand <laughs> somehow. That's exactly right. everyone, everyone, we have been teenagers too, <laughs> so we understand. <laughs> Okay, and maybe uh, another part it could be difficult, maybe for the youth, somehow, I don't know, some of them uh, end up not wanting to get up from bed, or not wanting to uh, get out of the room, and just staying there, uh, stuck in some behavior that is not helping them with everything we've said, like a routine, or like uh, connections, so how, like, I don't know what they could do, and if you have some specific tips that they can use to kind of uh, break with that <laughs> routine they already have, and it's not adaptive. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to sleep first, which is in the morning when kids are having a hard time getting up. Again, a lot of that is their biology, right? They're just not primed to wake up at this very early hour that is often required during the school week. Um, and so I encourage parents and kids to communicate and problem solve together. So letting the child or the teenager take the lead on how they want to problem solve the fact that it's hard to get up. Do they want a parent to support them in some way? Do they want them to come into the room? Do they want them to open the blinds? Bringing light into the room is incredibly helpful for getting your brain going in the morning. Um, reminding yourself of the things that are happening that day that you're looking forward to could be another way to try to get some motivational wheels turning. Or do they find the parents' involvement in this just so challenging that they would really rather just deal with it on their own, set, set 10 alarms, do whatever they need to do to get up and be rewarded for that, you know, doing that every day of the week, perhaps that earns them something um, in the household. So those are sort of the approaches we take and, and really lead, letting the teenager lead by telling the parents, what can you do to support me? 
sometimes support means backing off. Sometimes support means getting more involved. And that's really individual by, by person. Mm-hmm. And well, and the last part of this would be, um, what can a youth uh, do to, I don't know, work in these connections with other people? Because somehow some, some adolescents or some teenagers tend to think they don't really need connections. <laughs> so how do you um, convince uh, this kind of youth of uh, the importance of, uh, I don't know, trying to get some friends, trying to talk to other people, I know this is really hard for them. And uh, I don't know if you have any tips on, tips on that. That's a, that's a hard one. Okay. Do, you have any, do you have tips, maybe? I mean, I, it seems like it would be hard to convince. <laughs> you know, that doesn't seem like a right approach, like for a parent to tell a teen, hey, you need to go have fun with your friends. I mean, <laughs> doesn't sound fun at all. I mean, I... <laughs> Imagine something would be to, you know, more fun would be to create opportunities for the teen, you know, um, you have them pick an activity that they like that involves meeting other, other teens, um, and then encouraging them, right, providing like the logistical support to go, the financial support if one, if, you know, one can afford it. Right. And then letting them pick so they feel like, you know, like they, they have control over this. They can pursue something that they like and, you know, meet people along the way. Um, I mean, and I, you know, and I probably better to let like those friendships just grow from the interactions. Yeah, I know it's a hard question and it's something I, I keep on thinking about how to, uh, how to create like this, for example, opportunities. And I think it's related to um, um, social anxiety they get, um, trying to, to think about relating to others. It, I don't know, it's so much, it's so difficult for them. And uh, yeah, <laughs> if you have anything else to add here, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's important to note that anxiety and depression are like best friends. Um, so a lot of times when someone's feeling depressed, especially teenagers, they're also feeling some anxiety the anxieties in adolescence are often focused on their social world, right? So what is that person thinking about me? They must not like me. Oh my gosh, I must look so stupid or sound so stupid. Um, when those kinds of trains of thought are going through someone's mind, no wonder they don't want to be around other people. How exhausting, right? Um, and there's also treatment for anxiety, for social anxiety that can, that can assist with depression as well, because those two often do go hand in hand. But I think the quick tip there is just you know, by doing, hopefully, you know, as opposed to avoiding, the more that we avoid that social contact, actually, the worse those symptoms tend to get. Um, and I really like Mayi's point. It, again, it's got to be collaborative. Just telling someone, you need to get out and make friends, have friends is really not a fun way to do it. But finding, yeah. finding interests and finding things to do that interest you, regardless of other people, and then hopefully meeting people with shared interests in those settings, I think is a way to go. Yeah, I mean, support can also come from family. So even just kind of like holding family gatherings and being around family. I mean, I know it's gotten complicated with the pandemic, but, you know, I, I think there are some, you know, there are a couple of things that can be tried. Yeah. <laughs> I agree so much with you both. And, and thank you so much for these like, kind of advices that we had for this. And well, I would like to, to go to the second part of more in-depth uh, information about maybe anything you can share about your study, um, the research you're doing right now about depression. I don't know if you have some um, more uh, in-depth definitions or if you want to talk about the methodology, yeah, you can start on that. Well, and I'll pause here. I mean, I, I can either join this part or you can just do this part with Mei Yi. I know that in the past you did a little bit with Aaron, a little bit with me and a little bit with both of us. Um, I, I have another 10 minutes or so, but to be honest, like Mei Yi wrote this study and like it's hers. I'm like nearly there to like support and help and cheer her on and <laughs> Um, talk about sleep sometimes, and certainly I study adolescent depression, but this is definitely Maggie's project. So it's up to you, Andrea, how you prefer to handle it. Um, if you said you have only 10 minutes, I think uh, you, can, <laughs> you can leave, it's okay. <laughs> great, because it might be awkward with me just sitting here like smiling and nodding without much to say. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got gotcha. you. It was so nice to hear from you again, and I'm glad we're connecting again. And I hope, um, and I, you know, maybe I already told her this, but they just make such great content from what feels like, how are you going to, how are you going to make this all come together? But last time you certainly <laughs> did and the content was wonderful and we really appreciated working with you. So, um, thank so you thank so much for coming here. Then <laughs> it's really such a pleasure, pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> all right. Take okay. care. And we'll be in touch soon. I hope. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. So maybe, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know when, what you want to share first about your study. If you have some, um, yes, like a, some background, you know, how do, how do you justify this? Or what would be the problem that you have when you want to solve somehow? Yeah, so we're uh, doing a study called the Youth Emotion and Smartphone Study. Uh, what we're doing is using a smartphone app to learn about depressive symptoms in adolescents, age 12 to 18, because that's the age range where uh, teens are at especially high risk uh, of becoming depressed. And we, we you know, because with the phones, uh, uh, they can answer questions about how they're feeling and what symptoms they're experiencing every day, multiple times a day. So we get a really in-depth look at what each individual teen is experiencing. And, and that's what we, we want to do. Uh, I mean, there are therapies and medications for adolescent depression, but they're not anywhere close to 100% effective. And, you know, what we think the research seems to be saying is that the depression looks different in each teen. Like early on, we just said some teens are going to be really sad, but some are not going to be sad at all. Some are going to be irritable. And some other teens might be just kind of like bored and not interested in what they used to be interested in. So it can really look different in each teen, but all these teens are getting the same treatment. So what we want to do is to personalize the treatment to really make it tailored to help each teen the most possible so that they can get the most benefit uh, from the treatment. But to do that, we need a really in-depth study. So we're right one whole month, the teens are answering questions about their symptoms on the phone uh, six to seven times a day, um, just for like, you know, a brief survey, one minute survey, uh, you know, but frequently so that we know which symptoms are coming up the most, which symptoms seem to be like the most important ones that we really need to target first in treatment for them to get like the best, you know, like the most benefit. Okay. So you're going to do these like one month of, uh, frequently asking through this uh, application, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and so we're going to yeah do these brief surveys. Uh, and then at the beginning and end of the one month, we interview both the teen and the parent, like with the more standard questionnaires, interviews, uh, you know, uh, and then we also um, have the app. So I, I think you, you may know, while well, speaking of mobile apps, you, you, you know, most of our phones now can track our behavior in many ways, right? It can has GPS, it knows like how much we're moving around in a day, it knows how many steps we've taken, like it can estimate like how many texts we're sending and what kinds of words we're using. So these are all behaviors that researchers are starting to see, you know, have some links with depressive symptoms. So our app is also recording these kinds of behaviors because we want to see whether they can tell us you know, things about some, someone's depressive symptoms. Um, uh, yeah, you know, um, I mean, for, I mean, for a number of reasons, one, you know, like it's a, somebody reporting what they're feeling, that's a, an important piece of information, but what they're actually doing, their behavior in day-to-day -day life. I mean, that's another, like, you know, separate piece of information that is important to know, and maybe can tell us more about somebody's, uh, you know, experience and their depressive symptoms and, you know, help us to like personalize the treatment for them better. And the second reason is that if, if the, like these behaviors that the smartphone tracks, if it's kind of tells us very similar information to the symptoms, you know, then we don't have to keep asking people, you know, questions about how they're feeling. If we find that, for example, uh, the number of steps they take a day is, you know, very closely related to how tired they're feeling, which is one of the depressive symptoms, then, you know, maybe we can use that as an estimate and not have to ask somebody multiple times a day 
I mean, and like the long-term goal. So this current study is just this one month to understand, you know, in a, uh, about 50 to 60 teens, age 12 to 18, like individually, what does the depression look like? But the future goal uh, is if we can develop like a smartphone app that can track through behavior or a brief surveys, right, what someone's depression is like, and then help us to design an individually tailored treatment for them, you know, like that would be very cool. <laughs> And also, like, how much are they moving around from home? Like, are they going up a lot or are they staying home all the time? <laughs> right? Somebody who might be depressed might be staying home a lot of the time. How many texts or phone calls are they making? What kind of words are they typing in their texts? Um, I mean, so it's not that as researchers, we go and read the text, but what we can do is we can pick out certain words that are used more often by people who are depressed. There are certain kinds of words, more negative words or words that are more absolute, like I must do this. Like those kinds of words are used more often by people who are depressed. So I mean, that is, you know, every day our smartphone already collects a lot of data and it goes to these app companies, but if we can use it to do something good and inform science yeah. and inform society, why not? Yeah, this oh, study okay. is a paid study. So actually um, uh, uh, we're looking for families in South Florida uh, in Miami-Dade County, but also a couple of other surrounding counties, Broward, uh, Palm Beach, Collier, and Monroe counties, uh, they can participate and they can earn um, up to, you know, roughly $200 uh, for participating if they do everything, I mean, parents and, and teams total. Okay, and um, it would last uh, one month? From what I yes, it lasts one month. And I mean, so how to participate, we have a website. I mean, while we have our lab website and we have a, a page um, about this study. It's from 12 to 18. 18, yeah, 12 to 18. And they need to have one caregiver who is a parent or a legal guardian to participate with them. Uh, and if they go to this website, they can fill out our contact form, leave us their information, and then someone from our team will call them and ask them some questions to see whether they are you know, suitable to participate in this study. Uh, and they can also refer someone else. So if they know another family with teens who might be interested, they, they can refer someone else. And if the other family joins the study, then they can get paid also like $10 gift card for each family that they refer that joins our study. Um, a couple of other things that we are hoping will be beneficial to families because we are looking for teens who have some elevated symptoms of depression and they may not have like a clinical diagnosis, but if they have some symptoms of depression that is more than the average, you know, teen then they, I mean, and a couple of other questions that we ask, like they need to have a phone to be able to participate. Um, then, you know, then we will invite them to participate in the study and we'll do a screening. Yeah, so actually we do a screening. One of the things that teens and parents may not be aware is that the teen is actually depressed or, you know, have, you know, or have more symptoms compared to other teens. So we do this screening and we tell the parent and the teen, you know, that they have, whether they have higher levels of depressive symptoms compared to other teens. Uh, and then at that point, we also send them some resources for if they want to seek professional help. We also send them like information for hotlines. Like if they just need to talk to someone, uh, you know, they can definitely call or text the hotline. Um, and then we invite them to participate in the study. Uh, we also do something, we do suicide risk assessment and safety plan. And unfortunately, one of the symptoms of uh, depression is having suicidal thoughts or having you know, um, uh, suicide attempts. So for, for safety reasons, we do a risk, a suicide risk assessment. We do ask about thoughts of suicide, you know, or, or a suicide attempts. Um, and, uh, and we let the team know that when it comes to safety, we have to let the parent know. Sometimes we do have to let others know in order to keep them safe. Uh, and then we do a safety plan with them. So after asking about what kinds of like thoughts they've had in the past or currently, we'll do a plan uh, with them that collaboratively with the teen and the parent so that they you know, know what to do in order to hopefully avoid suicidal thoughts in the future. 
but you know, or if they have them, where you know who they can get help from, what kind of activities will help them, what kind of hotlines to call, which is the emergency room to go to, so that if there is something that's happening, there is a plan that can help them to hopefully prevent a crisis, uh, or even if there's a crisis, they can, you know, they they know what to do now that they've discussed it. Okay, and and um. Well, I would like to, to know a little bit more about this uh, relation of um, uh, the, the, the thing you said about how many steps uh, you, you have a day um, and the, what would be the relation to the, the being depressed? Maybe uh, a person depressed wouldn't have too many uh, steps a day or something like that. <laughs> Um, so, so this, so this research in terms of the behavior tracked by the smartphone and how that relates to depressive symptoms, that's a very new area of research. There definitely are some studies about this, but very few in teens. Uh, so that's why we are doing this study. Um, but I mean, but we could guess, right? We could hypothesize that if somebody is depressed and they may not want to get up and move around very much or do anything very much. So we might expect, yeah, somebody who is depressed may not be having a lot of steps and we may not see them leave their home very much. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it makes me think about the, the pandemic and how it uh, changed everyone's life and uh, reduced a lot of uh, those steps <laughs> that we took every day. So I think, uh, uh, well, it makes me think about the, the context and, and some other factors that would affect this. And it's really interesting. It's, it's really interesting to kind of take all of these uh, information that, I don't know, Facebook and the other apps take from you and kind of um, find relations to being depressed or something like that that you're watching on. I think it's really interesting. And... Um, well, you talk a little bit uh, about uh, suicide, and I would like to uh, uh, to know if you have any um, pages or any websites that uh, the people could uh, kind of uh, visit when they are having, I don't know, suicidal thoughts or hot, any hotlines. And I don't know if you have all of those um, information a little bit public that we can share maybe uh, when we publish this video or maybe when we publish um, uh, any other posts, <laughs> if you have those. <laughs> uh, I, I have some information, but it's not, um, you know, it's not on our website. Uh, should I, I mean, so there's crisischat.org, uh, there's the trevorproject.org, there's crisistextline.org, um, and then there's 211, which is for somebody who, you know, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call or text uh, and get crisis okay. counseling or kind of, you know, find uh, services. Um, yeah. And also, uh, what well, finally, uh, before we go, uh, I would like you to, to talk a little bit more about the screening you're doing and maybe if someone needs uh, or is uh, thinking they have symptoms and they could participate in this study, um, what do you want them to do? Like, do you want them to go to the website or talk to you directly? Do you have like a procedure on that? Uh, so they should, they should go to our website which I've put in the chat and I can email to you uh, too so yeah. that you have, you have that. And then they should click on our contact us form uh, and fill in their information. Like, you know, we'll ask for their name and their age, their phone number, their email, and then for the parent also. So a parent or a teen can fill this out, but we, we always call the parent first to make sure that the parent knows what the study is about and see that they're okay with proceeding before we reach out to the team. Okay, okay, perfect. Well, uh, it was really nice talking to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here today and having this uh, interview with, with us. Um, I am really honored to talk to you and uh, to kind of promote this um, a study you're working on. It, it sounds really interesting. And yeah, I don't know if you want to say something else, maybe I didn't talk about or ask. 
Um, well, if somebody is in a crisis, if they're already feeling like they have suicidal thoughts and it might be hard to stay safe, they should definitely let a trusted adult know. Uh, and the trusted adult should bring them to the nearest ER. Uh, I'll call 911. So if they're, if it's, yeah, if it's serious, you know, they shouldn't wait. They should take steps to get help right away. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mei.